There's a story continuing the theme of our astute former speaker. It was an excellent talk, thank you. <coughs> About Humanity Plus, which stems out of the concept of transhumanism. Now, this story is a very engaging story. It starts out with a group of anti transhumanists in academia, also known as postmodernists in the arts and humanities, and uh, they take great pride in the, their knowledge and expertise of the French philosophers, uh, Derrida, Lacan, Foucault, etc. And the idea about postmodernism, which has been great on many fronts, uh, unfortunately has not embraced transhumanism uh, with full arms. In fact, it, kind of looks at transhumanism you know, as being the other without yeah, yeah, right. respecting the other. So I'm going to tell you a little story to start out my talk about an event that happened at the university in Arizona, Arizona State University, which has tremendous funding for programs in future studies and anything future. Uh, the project is called the John Templeton Foundation uh, series on transhumanism, and it stems out of the religious studies and philosophy, uh, mostly religious studies looking at science. In any case, as the story goes, some very well-known academic scholars met and discussed transhumanism. And um, reading their material in a magazine, I was astounded. The astute scholars, very well known, had not interviewed any transhumanists about what they had written about. In fact, most of what was said was hyperbole, and I'm being very kind. It was disingenuous, it was a slap in the face, it was downright rude. It assumed that if you were a transhumanist, you were an idiot, that you didn't have any background in future studies, you had no background in psychology, <coughs> philosophy, technology, science, and you certainly didn't have a PhD or any academic background. In fact, you were a science fiction advocate, a geek or a nerd, and were um, living in a fantasy world about possible futures about uh, human enhancement and life extension and life expansion and augmentation and anything different than the postmodernist rhetoric about a dystopic future. Now, postmodernism has done some amazing things for society, one being breaking down the wall of the male-centric hierarchy and uh, universal language, uh, looking at the other, but not respecting the other necessarily, but looking at the other, um, breaking down the glass ceiling for women and um, respecting the idea of the cyborg as being a feminist proposition and so on and so forth. So I, I do have enormous respect for aspects of postmodernism, but I tend to be a hypermodernist and looking at the future not through rose-colored glasses of a Pollyanna scope, uh, but more as a practical optimist and a futurist in that sense. So this, uh, the long and the short of it is, and it ruffled my feathers because I didn't like that. I thought, how dare these brilliant scholars who I read about in every footnote and every article or uh, published paper uh, stemming from the arts and humanities, how could they do this? How could they write so flippantly, so knowingly about a culture I helped to pioneer without ever interviewing any of us? Not myself, not Max Moore, not Andrew Sandberg, not Nick Bostrom, uh, certainly not any of you sitting in the room. So I called up the managing editor of the magazine that would put this article together stemming from the Templeton Foundation at the university which has coursework on transhumanism. And I said, I don't understand. How could this be? And he said, well, let's talk some more. And we talked and over the month we ended up becoming um, good fast colleagues and he said, well, why don't you write a uh, response? And I said, I'm a little bit afraid to. I'm a little bit pissed right now. I'm afraid that I, I'm not going to be logical or rational. I'm going to be emotional. I don't want to do that. He said, well, give it a pause and get back to me if you want to respond. So I pulled together a half, well, let's see, more than a half dozen. I, I pulled together, I think, about eight academics 
uh, who were situated in universities, and either chairs of departments or at least you know, seasoned, and we responded to the articles written about transhumanism. And it caused quite a stir. Now, mind you, in the responses, me being the guest editor of the magazine, I said to my friends who were writing the responses with me, please, let's not be nasty, let's not point a finger, let's not be angry at the accusations forced at our door. Let's embrace these questions. Let's hit the questions with questions further. Let's look at our own problems. Let's de dissect transhumanism. In fact, let's deconstruct transhumanism and find out what the heck is wrong with us. Why would anyone think these things about us? So we must have a problem. We're not representing ourselves accurately or we're being very sloppy in our own thinking. So we put together this um, response. The response did so well and it had a, a very good tone to it, I think. Um, I had to tone down a few of the scholars to make sure that they weren't, uh, you know, digging underneath. And um, it ended up being a book. And that book is called H plus H minus Transhumanism and Its Critics. And I think it's an excellent book, and I highly recommend that you get the book because it has such thinkers as uh, Catherine Hales, Don Ide, Andrew Pickering, etc. at all, and then responding to the accusations are Nick Bostrom, Max Moore, um, Russell Blackford, a uh, number of others, Andrew Sandberg, myself, etc. And I think that we did a darn good job of not being nasty back, but defending our stats. And um, I'm showing some dignity in, in the way we handle this. So long and behold, a year later, I decide that I'm going to write my own book and uh, find a good academic publisher. But I'm not the type of person who's long-winded in that sense. I'm not that intellectual. I'm not that seasoned academically. So I'm better at bringing people together to work with me. And um, I have a book coming out uh, through Wally Blackwell in probably October this year, and Wally Blackwell, as you know, is a very sound, um, high-end publisher, and it's called The Transhumanist Reader. Uh, let's see, it's classical and contemporary essays about the science, technology, and philosophy of the human future. And um, I'll be using the book. There's a number of um, speakers that are in the book, so I, I think it's going to be an excellent cover of the ideas of Humanity Plus, the ideas of how transhumanism evolved, looking at it not just as the philosophy, but the science and the technology of life extension, and looking at the emerging and speculative technologies that we've been talking about for this, um, this weekend. So I think that's a very interesting project, and I'm bringing that in as a segue, uh, because I think that telling our narratives is very important when we're building a culture. It's not all rosy. It's not all, you know, we get mentioned in magazines and on the cover of magazines and in documentaries and people think, oh, it must be great. It's not. It's been a very, very difficult road because transhumanism is a small group of individuals who have a vision and it's expanded over the years to be sure. A brief history of transhumanism. The term was developed first by Alighieri Dante um, in the poem, as you know, um, going back to the early, early ideas about heaven and hell. Transhumanism was used in that sense as transhumanar, or umanar, as, a, as man overcoming his own predicament. Later on, the term transhumanism was used by T.S. Eliot in the poem The Cocktail Party, which won an award for its astute understanding of human nature. Uh, so that was transhumanized. The word transhuman has been used in different cultures in different ways as transhuman, human in transition. But it wasn't until Huxley wrote a story about um, new bottles for new wine that used the term transhumanism as a particular scientific term for overcoming our evolutionary boundaries as far as uh, dying and disintegrating and our bodies giving up and, and why we're in this predicament through our biology and evolution. Modern transhumanism is an idea that developed in the early 1990s and its author is Max Moore, who's a philosopher of uh, the continuous identity of the diachronic self, continuation of a personhood over time. I wrote the Transhuman Manifesto much earlier. I'm not a philosopher, so I wasn't uh, keen to that, but uh, I 
wrote the Transhuman Manifesto more along the lines of the cyborg, I suppose, and looking at space exploration because I hoped to be an astronaut at that time. Um, went through a pre-astronaut uh, training at the United States Space and Rocket Center. Uh, that didn't work out for me, but transhumanism did. Anyway, the long and the short of why we have the term humanity plus rather than transhumanism is because the term transhumanism has had some questionable connotations being an ism, being a type of philosophical elitist group of those who want to enhance humans and extend life beyond the human condition. Well, as we've discussed yesterday, and I, I tried to emphasize it as much as I could, that's not necessarily all of the truth, it's certainly part of it, but not all of it. There's a, a, a keen level of empathy and understanding and compassion for all levels of life forms and all uh, aspects of the human condition. So in um, the early 2000, mid-2000, um, transhumanism kept its position, but the term Humanity Plus came about because the main organization, XP Institute, closed down, and I was president of XP Institute for about four years, I think it was, and that was the leading transhumanist organization. We put on all the conferences in Silicon Valley and here and there, and, and brought um, the leading thinkers of the future together. Uh, produced the first email list on the future on the internet, and that's one of our claim to things. It was very exciting back in those days in the early 1990s when everyone was first on the internet. And we talked about the future in a very exciting way, but always in a way that brought in practical optimism. Not Pollyanna, not so much science fiction, but a practical way of looking at our future. Humanity Plus means pretty much the same thing as transhumanism, but as far as marketing is concerned, it has a more welcoming overtone. It means human plus. Um, certainly the anti-transhumanists like to put the minus in there, but that's okay too because there's many aspects of ourselves that um, we know need um, redefining and um, reapproaching. Yeah, so we, we do have some unresolved issues to take care of. So, and thinking about why is transhumanism or humanity plus so important to us now when we talk about living longer and the future in very pragmatic, um, practical optimism? Because we certainly do have a lot of problems in the world, and we touched on these yesterday. The enormous amount of difficulties in the world still exists. And some may say well, we're the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. Well, I disagree. My heart goes out to everyone, everywhere in the world. And I've lived in many places of the world and worked with different organizations such as a type of Peace Corps groups in helping natives of the United States, in South America, in the Amazon jungle, etc. And I've seen a lot of them. They're very uh, sordid conditions and very unhappy conditions. So that's never far from my mind, and I don't think it's that far from any of our minds when we think about all that we do have and all that we would like to have and how we'd like to help each other achieve it, especially those who don't have as much as we have. Now, where I'm staying here in Melbourne, interestingly enough, on my bed I look up at the wall and it's a giant map of the world. And this morning, well, six in the morning I woke, I was looking at it and I thought, gosh, Melbourne is a small city, but it's in a very, very large continent. Okay, then the United States is very large. Wow, look at China. Oh, Russia. Well, the term Russia was used. Okay, now look at India. Look at Africa. Look at these places. Now look at Paris and Helsinki. We are a minority, and that is for sure, and the rest of the world is suffering greatly, and it is our responsibility to do all we can within our means to try to resolve it. And as futurists, in applying the futurist terminology and skills, it is a responsibility and a joy and an honor to try to help others. So that's never far from humanity plus or transhumanism. Some of the issues in the world we've known about. I'm not um, a type of uh, person who's worried about the ozone. I am definitely an environmentalist. I was elected in 19, 1991 uh, through the Green Party in Los Angeles. I won the race. I was the uh, uh, council person for the 28th Senatorial District, which covered Malibu, Santa Monica, down to Redondo Beach. So it was a very elitist area of California. And my platform was, um, you know, green technology. 
Well, the problem with politics is people like to fight. After one year, I quit because I couldn't stand the fighting and the bickering and the arguing. No one was doing anything. People were complaining. But that does diminish, the, that does not diminish the fact that there are problems throughout the world that we are aware of and these numbers keep on growing. So, looking at what's needed, not just from futurology, and not just from design, but for every field and in a transdisciplinary way, is to pull our minds together and to think and do projects that actually do solve problems. Not just talk about it, but do it. Um, I love this quote from Jonas Salk. In order to survive, man has to evolve. Oh, I'll read it here. We need new kinds of thinking and new kinds of behavior, a new ethic and a new morality. And I think that Humanity Plus does ask that of, of people who certainly in the membership, but in our friends and extended family. It is a new type of morality. It's not the selfish me first. It's looking at me, take care of myself, and help take care of you as well. So in thinking about, and thinking, about what we can do, uh, Who's doing anything? Certainly Bruce Mao with Massive Change in Design is doing something very spectacular. If you've never seen his exhibition called Massive Change, you must see it. It's one designer who actually is putting his words to use. Uh, amazing exhibition, an amazing idea about the world and how design can help solve some problems. But one of the greatest thinkers in that area is Buckminster Fuller. And we talked about him ever so briefly yesterday. Design can solve problems. In fact, the definition of design is problem solving. The beauty of design, it has the artistic aspect of it as well. So we can use our creativity, innovation, uh, visionary ideas to think about how to problem solve. So um, the predicament that we have is that human enhancement, what we as humanity plus think about, uh, faces a behavioral, well, what is feasible and what is doable, what is practical, what is not infringing on anyone else's airspace, their vegetation, their living space, thinking about overpopulation, thinking about all the problems in the world. And I think they can be solved at the level that they are occurring through new and different types of innovative technologies as long as we think about problem solving and question and continue to question our own motivations and how we do it. But the whole point of Humanity Plus and transhumanism, of course, is human enhancement, and that is extending the human life well beyond the 122, 123 years. And for me, it doesn't matter what you look like or what substrate you exist within, just keep on living if that is your choice. And I feel it's a certain responsibility of Humanity Plus as an organization, as a nonprofit educational organization, is to help each other learn about this and do all we can to protect ourselves and those we love, which I hope is expanding all the time. Now, the socio-political issues, um, they continue to grow, but I think that, that we don't have to emphasize them as much as the postmodernists emphasize them. The uh, postmodernist stance is very dystopic. Uh, it it um, kind of gives big hugs to the science fiction scenarios of you know Terminator and you know the AI going to use humans as batteries and um, everything is going to be very frightening and there's no positive future. And certainly the opposite of that isn't the truth either. We don't know what the future holds. We're creating it as we move along. The sciences and technologies impacting human physiology are also impacting the systems we live within, the social networks, the educational institutions, the healthcare structures, government regulations, the changes we make to our own nature, and it will eventually affect all life forms, the ecosystem, and biodiversity. Well, we ask transhumanists think about this. We just don't think about extending our own life. We consider all the life forms on the planet because we coexist together. Now, that isn't to be overly fuzzy about it, it's to be practical, for goodness sakes. We exist here and we're part of this larger system, call it second order cybernetics or call it just a basic ecosystem. That's within which we exist. At the same time, there's this passion, this incredible passion that drives us forward and it can be exemplified in the poem by Dylan Thomas, rage. For God's sake, rage about this death and this illness that is at our door every moment, knocking and hammering. 
It's insane that we exist where people are dying needlessly. I just on the news the other day, I was in a, um, well, there's TVs everywhere. I was trying to get a drink at a bar and slammed my face on a, a screen at the bar is 100,000 people waiting for organ transplants. And how many are being delivered? Not that many. And in order to get an organ transplant, someone has to die. So you're sitting there waiting for your organ transplant, but at the same time, someone is going to have to die to give you their heart or their liver or their kidney or whatever you need. That to me is just so insane, and it goes back to Bucky Fuller. We have the resources, we just lack the distribution here. We have the resources for cloning our own organs and growing organs. But where's the distribution of all these blockages about ethics? Well, ethics are great, but don't put your religion in my ethics. It's fine if you have your religion, keep it for yourself, and live by your own religion, but we must be careful about infringing our beliefs onto other people. Plus, that is the organization we have today. There have been more organizations. There's Extra Beat Institute, there's World Transhumanist Organization. Well, those face out, we have Humanity Plus, and it's kind of been this socio political handshake. Many of you know that Extra Beat Institute and World Transhumanist Association were at odds because many extropians were considered to be libertarian. They were the intellectual Oxford scholar elite of, you know, me first, Randian, and then you had World Transhumanist Association, who were the liberals who wanted to give consciousness and rights to animals and whatnot. Well, those were extreme assumptions about both camps. There was never that type of anger. It was just impressed upon to create, a, you know, a, a, a combative nature. Anyway, we have Humanity Plus now, which is a more feasible, workable situation where there's more diversity, multiplicity, acceptability of our differences. And I love that about Humanity Plus, and that's why I am with it, and I'm, I'm proud to be involved in it. So what is Humanity Plus, and what is it doing? Well, what does it mean? Of course it means transhumanism. That goes without being said. But it also means something more. I think it means education and making, um, creating venues and projects so that we can help educate one another. Um, so, what does it do? We have um, a number of different projects. Uh, the latter part of last year, in 2011, I created a strategic report for Humanity Plus and looking at a new direction for it because I, I thought it lacked a little bit of focus. So I spent a couple of months developing a strategic plan and scenarios using basic uh, futurology uh, tools. And I, I invited six people to uh, answer questions for me. I did a little survey and saying, what are our, you know, what's our environment? Who are our, who are our, you know, uh, friends who are, you know, opposed to us, um, who are stakeholders, you know, what are our best assets, what do we, where do we need to grow? It's a bit of just constructing uh, transhumanism again, but at this time it was just deconstructing the organization to see what we were missing, why we were not as successful as we ought to be, given that we're the only organization that is doing this. Now, mind you, there are plenty of futurist organizations. There's the World Future Society, etc. We've heard about many of them this weekend. But there's no other organization that is actually focused on life extension, human enhancement, and resolving some of the issues concerning human enhancement and life extension. So, if we have a circle, like a cell, like an amoeba, like an environment, and we put in human futures in the center of that circle, and then we think about what are the parts of that circle, I think we can break it down into four ways. We have the appended mortal, meaning we want to extend human life, so we're not strictly mortal anymore. Now we don't have to necessarily be immortal, we can just have a, a change of what life means and what death means. The transformative body, or transformed body, appending it, extending it, external organs, as Stellar says, is the external exoskeleton could be looked at as an organ, for goodness sakes. Uh, avatars as a leaf ayatera, and in second life, her avatars are some personas. Bion primo post, uh, post human is a whole body prosthetic. Okay, so that's the transformed body. 
Extended person. What is an extended person? That means our personhood, our continuous identity expanded outside our biology. We're already doing that with email, the internet. Uh, yesterday I talked about mind file. And there's a number of different ways we can approach that. The extreme end of it, or possibly extreme end of it, could be the upload of a brain emulation. Who knows whether that'll happen or not? I tend to think it probably will. And the contested culture within which we exist. Well, that goes back to my beginning talk about the Templeton Foundation and the postmodernist academics who disregarded transhumanism because probably maybe they were just really afraid of it. And I don't blame them, to be perfectly frank. It is kind of a scary notion to think that there are a group of people who say you don't have to die the way that we've been dying for the past hundreds of thousands of years. Or that we could live in different substrates, in different environments, that there is no man and woman as essential, that we want to change the whole structure of universals. That's a pretty uh, big pill to swallow. So the contested culture is probably the biggest area where humanity plus, H plus, fits in. Now, taking a look at the appended mortal, I'm just gonna skip over that because my talk was pretty much on that yesterday, but it's, it's looking at the, the biological issues and how we're appending. The, um, of course, the um, very smart design and prosthetics, I think, have become so elegant and sophisticated. They're very beautiful. And as I said yesterday, I think some of these legs are prettier than my own. In fact, some of these hands and appendages are actually not normal. They're selective enhancement. They far exceed what the normal body can do. Um, looking at how I developed my strategy for this and my notes going through the, uh, the individuals who I collaborated with um, deals with prototype notes. But I think that the reason I wanted to show this slide is not because I like my scribbles, but because it's within those scribbles, those doodlings, that we get our greatest ideas. So never disregard any scribble and toss it away because prototyping all the time is really essential to developing how to intervene within this contested culture. One way I did it was using the human body rather than a cyborg body. Another way it could be done is, is using different technologies to go inside the body and see what's going on for the appended mortal and the transformative body. When we look at this issue of expanded persons, uh, certainly it's going to have different elements of nanotechnology involved in nanomedicine and artificial intelligence, very sophisticated, um, strong AI perhaps. Um, another way to look at it is being, you know, as the former speaker said, let's try to be futurists ourselves and learn some of the language and the rapport and prototyping our own possible future. Design your enhancement and your own, your own extension. And in doing so, think critically about what some of these alternatives are and these options. If you want your personhood to be multiple personas, for example, if you want your one body to be multiple bodies, for example, you have to be very critical about it. Yes, it's fun to think about, yes, it's very science fiction in some ways, but that is the problem that when you look at the postmodernist rhetoric that disregards transhumanism, what is said that transhumanists do not have the efficacy, the intellectual acumen, or the, the um, set of skills to really think about the future in the way it needs to be faced. Well, of course that's not true, but it, it's a red flag. Let's pay attention to what we're missing. So all of us can take a look at our own bodies, our own lives, and dissect it in ways that can be very clever and fun in prototyping uh, how we're going to enhance and expand ourselves. Now, the contested culture is the culture within which the topic of human enhancement is situated, and in which seeks that type of sociopolitical um, kind of dialectics that are continuously going on. And um, we have to think about, in modifying ourselves and improving ourselves, what is it we're really improving here? So where does this whole situation fit? What does it look like? What does it mean to be H plus? Well, I did this diagram, and I showed that postmodernism is the, the area that we've been in since modernism. Now remember, postmodernism defies some of the uh, tenets, some of the dictums or maxims of modernism. And it broke through the male um, he, him, his. You know, so now we learn to say he or she, 
him or her, so we have this type of political correct. The universals are broken down, like breaking down the Berlin Wall. We've broken down and deconstructed so much that has been before us, built by the Western world as what is the universals and the norm of humanity. So that has been broken down, now it's open. And even though it's still difficult, and even within the postmodernist rhetoric, there's still this disregard for the other, even though they discuss the other. The other is so important, but they're not looking at the other. They're being very judgmental. So in turn, we ought not to be judgmental back. We need to understand what the problem is. So I look at it as postmodern coming into our area. And if you're interested in the future, you kind of one leg or one foot in each area. You're partly in postmodernism, because that's the environment within which we exist. And you're partly in transhumanism. Whether you're a transhumanist or not, it is the environment within which we exist. It is happening. So if we're somewhere situated there, we've got to be also part in H+. And in doing so, if H Plus is a nonprofit organization that looks at educating people about the future and helping us all learn and develop better skills in understanding our own future and protecting ourselves and our family and, and all aspects of the environment within which we live, live because we have to exist together and protect each other, um, the best way is through design, because I'm a designer, so. If you're a scientist, you'll say the best way is science. But for me, I think design kind of touches on all notes and, <laughs> and on the entire scale of possibilities. So it can be broken down into society and beliefs, marketing and um, consumers, science and technology, ethics and biopolitics. And each one of those breaks down to the fears, the activism, the hopes and the anxieties the uh, vitality and virtuality and simulations that we're seeing and that we're working with constantly, and also the new types of technologies. So that brings us to humanity plus, what is it really? Where is it? What does it do? Are you members? If you're not, why aren't you? If you don't understand what it is, how can I help you learn more about it? So I'm going to switch here now to the website. Um, I might need Adam to help me do this. Um, okay, am I supposed to push? Okay, so um, the website is new. We had we've had several different versions. This is an idea that I came up with because I was trying to, after the whole Templeton Foundation and dealing with you know the postmodernist rhetoric and then coming up with the book, and, and it's, which is now with the publishers, I really had to face not only where my shortcomings were, but where the whole shortcomings of the organization and, and, the, and the culture in, with, in which um, human enhancement is so strongly situated with life extension. So um, it seemed to me that there were six projects that best exemplified what we could do to help educate others and to bring people together to do projects. Now, long before I ever came around, of course, we had Humanity Plus F at conferences. Um, there's the H Plus magazine. There's um, also the Gata Prize uh, for molecular manufacturing. There is a desktop publishing. There is the H Plus Press. We put out a couple of books. But um, most importantly, I think, it's not the specific project, but it's the attitude of the project. And it's at a point where if it doesn't work, we'll renegotiate it. We just want to be a, um, a, a, I guess a, a locus of experience, one might say, for this vision of the future. And it's, it's not something like um, world future society, you have to be a futurist. And it's not as strict as some of the organizations that have political views or uh, philosophical views that um, present a, a religious um, dictum. So it's, it's become where multiplicity is very important for it. So, um, so one of the projects that um, one of our members, Ben Gertzfall, is working on, if you know Ben, he's uh, very involved in artificial general intelligence. Uh, he has a project that he came up with called Future Day. And Future Day is, will take place on uh, the 1st of March every year. And um, we had this great event in Second Life, and we had it in real time in Hong Kong, and uh, one in uh, San Francisco area, and one in the East Coast area. It was really great fun. 
Um, in Second Life, I really enjoy doing projects in Second Life because it's a totally different environment and it's, it's great to see people outside their usual um, interface. Uh, that was, yeah, could you turn this off now, thanks. That was great fun. I think it was very successful. So Future Day is a day where we celebrate the future and celebrate just ideas and anything goes, of course, with the news of young. Just to be, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Banana. Mr. Banana. <laughs> so we're looking at Future Day as being something promising and a lot of fun and to have and make it kind of like happening around the world where on Future Day we link up in Second Life or virtuality and different um, venues in the metaverse. And it'll be a, 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 it's growing and I think it's going to become a very fun project. We have a lot of organizations that want to team up with us. Um, so that's one project I think ha that has legs. The other project that um, I find really interesting is called H Plus TV and I'll be producing and hosting that. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to go about doing it but I'm building my team at the moment. Um, in the 1980s and 1990s, I hosted and produced, uh, yeah, hosted and produced a, a TV show called Trans Century Update. I switched it to Transhuman Update and then back to Trans Century Update. Got a little nervous there. Because uh, I had a 100,000 viewing audience in Santa Monica area up to Malibu and again down to Redondo Beach. And also I had my own slot in Telluride. If you know Telluride, it's, it's my home, my love away from home, I suppose. Um, but it's a mountain village, and I had a show every Monday at 5 o'clock on the future. So that was great fun. And early on, I was excited because I had the original inventor of the ele electric automobile on, and uh, we talked about the early technologies before they you know, hit Wired Magazine, or you know, Kevin Kelly got a hold of them and really produced them, which is great for Kevin, but it was, it was a fun time. And I miss doing TV, so I'm looking forward to doing this. Um, I hope it's going to be a good program. I've already spoken to a couple of people here about being on it. Um, our former speaker is one who's doing something with his there. <laughs> um, so I think it's going to be a good show, and I think it'll be educational, and I think students could probably get some credit. So I want to link it with the university, and I'm just considering now whether uh, to do that with the Singularity University or another university. But I think it, it's going to be a fun project. Um, another project, another initiative is, of course, our magazine, which has been going on for quite some time. If any of you are writers and you want to write for the magazine, I suggest you get in touch with Ben Gertzwell, Michael Nissimov, or Rachel Marone, because they're very excited to have new people come along and send up articles uh, for publishing. And we have lots of viewers. In fact, uh, originally the magazine was edited by Are You Serious? And if you know Are You Serious, he has a great history with cyberpunk and the cyber culture. Uh, Mondo 2000 magazine. So he's a very seasoned and he still writes for the magazine. So that's another way that you can get your voice heard. Okay, so here are three projects involved in Future Day. You could be on my TV show, uh, H Plus TV. Um, you can write for the magazine, of course, if you're good. I mean, don't write junk. <laughs> write something tasty, at least your first article anyway. Then, yeah. um, and I'll be happy to introduce you to any one of the editors. Um, another project is our conferences. Of course, this conference here, but Adam put on this conference before he was elected to the board. I have to tip my hat to Adam. He was just elected last week as an opt-in board member. We just had our elections. We reduced our board of directors from 10 down to 5, so it was a very, very tough competition. And it got a little political, a little bit uh, nasty there for a while, but and it had good results. And I think that everyone who was elected uh, did very well, and I'm, I'm pleased to be working with everyone. But we do have opt-in, so if you're interested in working, um, submitting um, a uh, statement to get on the board or to at least work with the organization, we welcome you. Uh, so thank you, Adam, and congratulations. So everyone, let's applaud Adam for that. Uh, we had our last conference in Hong Kong, and that was fabulous. It was the first time a transhumanist conference was in Asia. So Hong Kong, of course, you know, is the apple of the eye there, and it's doing very well. It was in the design department of Polytechnic University, and it was a success. So that was exciting. Before that, uh, the conference was at Parsons in the schools uh, in New York City. And if you know Parsons, it's a very well-known design school. So I co-chaired that conference with one of the associate deans, Ed Keller. 
and it was called Transhumanism Meets Design. And boy, was that fun, because as you know, in the design world, there are many postmodernists, so that was very tasty. <laughs> we had some very high-end uh, academic design scholars and chairs who were throwing the postmodernist towel into the, into the center of the circle. But it was fun. It was, it was very tasty, and some good debates came out of that. And I think we all learned something. So in New York, that was great. We'll be holding another conference at Parsons uh, in 2013. It'll be on the singularity. So it may be called uh, Des Design Meets the Singularity because we need more design. We need more innovation in design, thinking about the future, especially in these areas that have such um, uh, newsworthy capital. I can't think of another way to say it. Whether or not the singularity happens, who knows? I kind of agree with Aubrey in, in his statement about it, or Max Moore, that'll happen in searches, but it's, you know, may not happen the way uh, Kurt Swellian or, or Bernard Vinci um, considers it to happen. But they're all great ideas, so let's discuss them, and let's discuss them from a point of design, strategy, thinking about the future. So that's going to be very exciting. We'll also have another conference in Hong Kong, no, not, sorry, Beijing in 2013. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, 2012, we haven't really planned a conference yet because we've been so busy with elections that went on and on. But it looks like we may be having a conference in San Francisco. So that'll be really cool. I think that'll be great. Um, what else can I say about Humanity Plus? Um, I think one of the more important areas is building our culture. I don't like being called the 1% or the 1% or the 1%. I don't like that. I'm, I'm not an elitist. I never have been, although, you know, maybe my family has been, but I, I never felt like that, although when I lived in Telluride, I guess I was. But I never felt it. I always felt that I wanted to get along with everyone and diversify as much as possible. In fact, most of my, I don't have two friends who are exactly alike. I have friends who are children, I have friends who are ancient, I have friends who are very diverse in lots of different fields, and I like that, and I think transhumanism needs that. We need more diversification, as long as we all agree that we can solve the problems and work towards that and think about our future. We have to have a commitment to it, though. And if one of the tenets of transhumanism is engaging life extension and enhancement, perhaps that's important to at least support to some degree, rather than to be totally against it, although that might be tasty as well, and offer some good dialectics. So the bottom line is I think we need to grow. And the more I think about it, no matter how many different strategies I can do, or different um, uh, you know, strategic ports and rebuilding the organization or steering it one way or another, it seems to me we just need to grow. There's not enough of us supporting life extension, there's certainly not enough of us supporting enhancement, and I think that people need us, whether they know it or not, so perhaps we can um, add to the momentum in that regard. So I think that's all I'm going to say about that, but I'd like to hear from you if it's positive or negative. Please speak forward. If you have an idea that could help the organization grow or form um, new directions, something that you think that we need to be doing that we're not doing, I want to hear from you, and I'm sure the rest of the board membership does as well. So thank you very much. diversification of, you know, the, the body enhancement groups, not the piercers, the tattoo people, you know, that whole spectrum there. We also have, we've had a growing relationship with academics. We have a, a very fine scholarship of, of writing from, um, you know, so it's not just a culture, it's, it's informative in many ways. Uh, the readership is, uh, I don't want to give a quote without knowing, but it's really high. 
please ask Michael and Esimov or Rachel Morone. Email them because I don't want to give you a number and make a fool out of myself. I don't want to go too high or too low. So I'd rather give you the facts. Okay. okay. And, and the conferences? Um, you mentioned the ones in 2013. Do you have like the ones for those when they're occurring? Um, the one that we have where that's in the planning stage is going to be in San Francisco 2012. We're looking at probably early November. Yeah. So that'll be in the Bay Area, probably San Francisco. Uh, thank you. Thanks. On the topic of um, growing the sort of movement, what are your thoughts on the um, field of positive psychology um, as being under the kind of umbrella of um, humanity plus? Could you say that again? So, after the um, topic of growing the um, movement, what are your thoughts on um, the whole positive psychology movement and how that fits in under the trans uh, sorry, humanity plus umbrella? The positive psychology movement. Could you tell me what you refer to? Okay, so the, um, so, sorry, not really the movement, but the positive psychology field where we're trying to use psychology not just in the treatment of mental illness, but to enhance um, human uh, happiness and condition. Oh, okay. Uh, now, are you referring to perhaps David Pierce? Um, or are you talking about a specific um, psychological foundation that is looking at? It's a, a sub-branch of psychology. Um, uh, I think it's, it's C, C. For example, Southern yeah. Okay, now in that regard, are you talking about uh, doing um, very natural processes like meditation and working on affirmation? Are you talking about nootropics or neuropharmacology? Um, well, the field is more concerned with using um, psych uh, psychology techniques like interventions to um, enhance uh, people's cognitive abilities um, through, uh, uh, sorry, being able to, um, I'm not expert this, but being able to better deal with um, other, uh, situations and decision making and uh, general happiness and. It sounds great to me. I mean, but I don't, I don't understand if it's, if it's just practicing psychology, like therapeutic psychology, to learn behavioral adaptation, behavioral change. If it's a behavioralist school, or if it's dealing with um, neuropharmacology to like ser uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, you know that, or if it's dealing with nootropics to experiment with um, altering states. I don't. I don't. Well, my understanding is um, basically using psychology. Not in such a therapeutic sense, but in more of an enhancement sense. Um, so, no um, uh, pharmaceuticals, but just. Um, sort of well, if it's enhancing, it's got to enhance some way. So, what you're saying, it would be enhancing through behavioral readaptation and changing behavior. I think it's excellent. Now, I don't know the group that you're talking about, because psychology is not my field, but I like the idea of changing behavior and practicing more. Um, healthy, positive interrelationships than, you know, being angry and negative. So I think that that, if it's called an enhancement, I think it's, it seems very practical and rational to me, unless there's something I'm not getting. Are you supportive of it? I'm not an expert in field at all. I just thought it seemed to be a lot of overlap in that. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Is this, is this like the chicken soup for the soul sort of Positive thinking you talk about, or the law of attractive that attraction? No, so that's actually. I'd just like to say, uh, we um, a place you could sort of tackle to kind of get this thing on. I kind of think that uh, engineering might play a big role in. Um, getting some of the technology out in terms of robotics and things like this. I just think that there needs to be a full like, take, uh, tackle of the engineering field and getting some sort of uh, more imaginative people instead of uh, following the role as an engineer myself. I just see a lack of imagination across the <laughs> You just said that you don't have any of a lack of imagination. <laughs> no, no. As an engineer myself, I, I, I'm, I have imagination. But across the everyone else does it. Everyone, <laughs> That's really good. Or the majority of other people don't seem to <laughs> No, I understand what you're saying. No, I'm just teasing you. Yeah, I think that transdisciplinarity in, in academics is very important. You know, it's 
shaking hands. So if you're in the engineering department, you want to shake hands with the design department and then slip over into the arts department and, and see what's cooking. But I think engineering has certainly changed a lot, hasn't it, since you know, early on. I, I think probably an area where there's a lack of um, uh, aesthetics and perhaps innovation is in programming. And I'm, I uh, beg your pardon, any computer scientist here, a programmer, but <laughs> most it seems like that mathematics is the focus. And if you have a high IQ in mathematics, then you know you're the simple not. And I think that that dismisses a lot of other levels of or types of intelligence. Just because one is skilled in mathematics doesn't mean that he or she has a better intelligence than someone who is creative in aesthetics or you know other ways of seeing the world. So I, I think that one thing that can break down there is is just um, pursuing it yourself and spreading the meme. You know, it's it's kind of like grassroots in that way. Um, certainly, if you have an idea, though, of at a conference, maybe we could have a session on that. You know, breaking through the the dogma of engineering and take a look at some you know dialectics there. You know, some good debates on that. I think that would be very exciting, especially at the conference at Parsons, for example. You know, because um, engineering is you know based on you know, mathematics, which is based on the architecture of thinking, which is part of the singularity. You know with AI, AGI and whatnot, supercomputers. So then looking at it from, through the lens of design, it would have to think about not the workability and the problem solving of design, but also the aesthetics. Um, thank you so much. I enjoy listening to you. Actually, today is my birthday. Oh, no. I, am, birthday. I am 73 years old. And I thought that this conference was the best way to celebrate it. <laughs> my, my question is, I mean, my brain is still good. Still I have a lot of curiosity. My health is very good. I would like to live long enough to see religion to disappear. Uh, but uh, at what time, how, how far in the deterioration process um, we can jump in the world? How, how can I explain? Am I, I am 73 today, am I too old to think that I can dream with a uh, hundred years old? Oh, of course not. I think Aubrey could probably answer that very well for you, but no, you have to have hope, and I don't think that we have to look at ages as, you know, something that stands in the way of living long. It depends on what your genetics are, frankly. I mean, you could be ten years old and, you know, have a, a brain tumor and, you know, die. Or you could be 73 and have a fully functioning body with superb genes and a, um, a body that heals itself quite well. And also, there, it's very important to take a look at your body, like in my talk yesterday. Become the master of your own fate, the captain of your own ship. Prototype yourself out. Think about what you need to do to keep on regenerating. The point is to stay as young as long as possible as we age. And as Aubrey says, you know, it's you know, regenerative medicine it has to look at the different levels of how we're resurfacing and restructuring our bodies for the long term. So stay healthy as long as you can. Good for you. Happy birthday. Hi. Um, I've just got two questions. Um, uh, per person, per person. That's just not enough time. Uh, I've just got one question. <laughs> Sure. Which is, what do you think are the major threats that we should be working to prevent that would prevent us from allowing the vision of humanity plus to come into existence? God, you know, at my first slide, we, we, you know, whoa, we've got some problems to face. I would have liked to spend a weekend with some of the speakers and some of you all and just break it down and figure out where we need to, you know, line up our ammunition 
and start, you know, marching forward. Um, if we stay alive long enough, then certain technologies will come around, so we have to, you know, be healthy. And then yesterday I showed my DNA, and it was kind of scary to show it to you all, you know. I don't like having to look at some of the things. I didn't show you all of it, but I've already had cancer twice, and eye replacements, and this and that done, which I reveal gratefully. But I did that only to show you that I've been replacing parts of myself, especially the past few years in the research that I was doing for my PhD. So, um... I think that, now Aubrey, what do you, is it Leon Cass, is it Fukuyama, is it the uh, uh, bioconservatives that we have to fight, or is it ourselves for not being proactive enough? Maybe we're our own worst enemy, we talked about that yesterday, I believe. What do you think, Aubrey? Um, well, I'm going to say a bit about it um, in, my, in my talk, but um, I think the own psychology the public psychology, yeah, it's, it's, we take a look at DARPA, we take a look at women's rights, we take a look at starving children, we take a look at war, and we think, oh my god, how horrible. And like me lying in bed this morning at 6 o'clock when I woke up, looking at this big map going, God, I am part of the 1% of the 1%, look at this big world, and all these problems happening in these big continents, just the horrors that go on, the beatings, the killings. And then here we sit in Melbourne and look at Paris and Helsinki and LA, you know, where everything's not so bad. We're our own worst enemy in many ways, and that's why uh, the gentleman over here, when he brought up, you know, what, about psychology, you know, and what you were saying here about the, the, the elements of behavior and causing ourselves to rethink. Um, I, I don't know, I have to say, I don't know. It's a toss up for me whether it's. Um, you know, the people like the postmodernists who, who don't think through things just because they don't want to let go of their, their tenure at the university based on postmodernism, that there could be a thing like transhumanism that could change the dynamics of everything, that there could be an interesting, exciting future rather than the dystopic future. So I think that that's scary for them, but if you look at it in a larger perspective, we have to be open to change. And the talk on the, the Futures talk that we just had was very poignant about that. You know, we have to think, we have to strategize and think like futurists ourselves. So I'm going to leave that with a question mark, and I'll get back to you. I have to... I have too much going on in my head at the moment because I see so many problems and so many possibilities that I can't narrow it down other than it's probably our, ourselves stepping on our own feet, preventing our flying towards the future. Natasha, um, my question is in terms of vision for Humanity Plus. Um, you may already be involved in this, but I reflect back to the movie Avatar, um, where I searched the internet after watching that movie to see the backlash of negative commentary um, and religious, you know, hysteria over the fact that somebody discarded the body and went in to live in a new body. Um, and I, I found nothing. I mean, I searched really quite thoroughly for this because I thought this will really hit at the social mores of society and psychology of the people. Um, now, Humanity Plus, to me, would seem to be very capable of playing a role in film and in um, consulting to filmmakers in terms of developing movies with any type of theme along these lines. And is that already happening? Um, I think positive psychology was um, around the sudden stuff, perhaps learned optimism and so on. Um, I think the, the, the psyche of the of the people was very optimistic in that they took this rolling of, from one body to another in that movie really easily, probably because it was very beautiful. Yes, it yes. Comments on that. Yes, exactly. And if you think about the film Vanilla Sky with Tom Cruise and you know the cryonics, the doers look so beautiful and, and just gorgeous. Um, you know, I was thinking about that. Um, I was in Hollywood for many years, and I worked for 20th Century Fox, I worked with Francis Ford Coppola, I was in a number of films myself, and I made a number of films that have been shown at Women in Video and the United States Film Festival and all of that, and I, I've steered away from it because of extreme disappointment, extreme disappointment in the narrow vision of, of the film industry. 
And um, I'm looking at returning to it, thinking that maybe you know things have caught up with the, the transhumanist vision. That's why I'm focusing on the H plus TV thing. Um, but I, I, you've got some excellent points there, and I agree with you that perhaps one of the initiatives for Humanity Plus would be to do to have a small firm um, that is a consulting for some of these uh, stories, some of these narratives. I do a lot of interviews with a lot of documentaries. Um, not, I'm not bragging about it. I just enjoy it, and I'm glad to be able to do it. And I'll spread the wealth there. You know, I don't need to always be in the in the, in the you know center there, but. Um, we just need more voices and good voices to be heard and appear in a lot of these televised programs about the future, etc. But I think that you have a, a good point there. Thank you. you. Put a seed. You planted a seed on her birthday. <laughs> okay, finished? Okay, thank you.